Good day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. I was going to make this movie as an outside walk and talk, but as you can see, I've got clouds and grey skies. I got wind, and the last three times I set out to make the movie, halfway along the walk to the starting spot, it started to drizzle. So I'm afraid with 10 degrees Celsius and wind and unpredictable drizzle, I'm going to go and sit in the hut and make it an inside movie. So sorry about that, but the scenery is not going to be quite as interesting. There goes wattle blossoms a week before spring starts. A pretty interesting scenery is background visuals or at least that was the plan but like I said we're talking 10 degrees Celsius outside versus 27 degrees inside the hut thanks to Potius Bellius so I'm afraid you're stuck with me sitting in the chair inside now the topic of this video is child sexual assault survivors, suicide death rates, unpacking the statistics. So it's a pretty upsetting topic, be warned, I plan on digging deep here. A week or so ago I uploaded a video where I briefly glanced on the subject of the extremely increased suicide death rates experienced by the survivors of child sexual assault. In the comment thread under the video, which was addressing the link between pregnancy termination and increased incidence of breast cancer, and that link did used to exist back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, back in the days when abortion was illegal there were a lot of septic abortions, 25% of women having abortions died, half the survivors were sterile because they had emergency hysterectomies or scar tissue. And it meant that people who were pregnant for the first time having a termination, if they survived half of them, weren't ever able to get pregnant again, which meant they never breastfed and breastfeeding is protective against breast cancer. But that link no longer exists because <clears throat> pregnancy termination is no longer illegal so the rate of septic abortions has dropped out through the bottom of the statistical floor and there's no longer an associational link but i did mention that there was an associational link between pregnancy termination and depression and there is presumed to be a causal link between depression and suicide okay I tried to put that in perspective by branching out to mention that um, combat veterans have twice the suicide death rate of the background population, that combat veterans' children have three times the death rate of the background population. And uh, that compares to survivors of child sexual assault who have 18 times the death rate of the background population from suicide. They also, child sexual assault survivors, have 49 times the death rate from accidental drug overdoses. But one of my subscribers, Gummy Royd, I think it was, hi Gummy, bit of a shout out here, put a question in the comment thread or a comment which suggested that it would be interesting to see what kind of video I could make to expand upon the phenomenon of child sexual assault survivors and the increased rate of suicide but gummy roid appeared to um, misapprehend the scale of the phenomena because the comment said uh, that i should unpack the subject of the 18 percent increased rate of suicide deaths among child sexual assault survivors <clears throat> So that pretty much sentenced me to making this movie because I, I have to correct you, Gummy Royd. It's not 18% increase. It's 18 times the rate. 
So that's 1,800% increased death rate. Um, <clears throat> so I think before we start going further into these statistics, I'd like to mention where I got the statistics from. Then we'll have a bit of a look at the mechanism. Then we'll have a bit of a look at the numbers that have come up when I've crunched the statistics and put them through my alligator. Some people call them calculators, but I call them alligators because they allege all kinds of numbers are correct. Okay, so we begin with the military veterans. According to the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, military veterans, not necessarily combat veterans, have twice the background society's rate of being treated for psychiatric, psychological issues, of being depressed and of dying by suicide. They're American figures. The Australian figures, appropriately perhaps, I read them in the Weekend Australian newspaper in 2005. Uh, the Australian figures were compiled by the Australian Institute for Health and Welfare Statistics in reports on Vietnam veterans' morbidity and mortality and Vietnam veterans and their children's morbidity and mortality. And they found that combat veterans have twice the background society's suicide death rate and that combat veterans' children have three times the society's background suicide death rate, which is a little bit hard to get one's head around. You'd think that being in combat would be worse than having a combat veteran for a parent, but a combat veteran may have grown up in a happy childhood. If that happy child joins the military, they are put through a basic training progress, which ha has as its goal to depersonalize the individual, to reprogram the individual, to militarize them, to turn them into a different sort of person, somebody who's much more violent, much more obedient, much more goal oriented, and then put them out into the field where they are subjected to life threatening, sudden, intense, terrifying incidents and experiences, and it may go on for a while. And, uh, I think Professor Grossman at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, David Grossman, is a professor of killology, a two-tour Vietnam Green Beret veteran. He found that uh, 60 days continuous combat turns 98% of participants into psychiatric casualties. And he said the other 2% were sociopaths or psychopaths before they got into the military and they thrive in combat. The ones who thrive in combat have a high rate of being promoted in the field, being decorated for acts of valor and a very high death rate. Okay, but everybody else comes out of it pretty scattered and shattered. And when they're scattered and shattered, the overload of, of stress damages their amygdala. Now the amygdala is translates as walnut, some people say it as almond, but it's it's a little, you know, area in the brain under the cerebrum. Um, it's it's connected to the hypothalamus and the posterior hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary and between them the posterior hypothalamus and the pituitary secrete and release because the posterior hypothalamus secretes hormones and stores them in the pituitary and one end of the pituitary only stores and releases the other end of the pituitary actually produces and stores and releases hormones on demand and these hormones regulate all sorts of body functions anything from uterine contractions and letting down breast milk from oxytocin and feel good from oxytocin and and bonding and, and attraction between people as well or the anti-diuretic hormone to stop your kidneys from throwing out excess water when your blood volume is reducing because you haven't had a drink for a while blood pressure with vasopressin all these hormones 
to determine the metabolic rate and functioning of your body, they're run by the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And the amygdala is closely connected structurally, physically, in proximity wise. Uh, and the effect of stress overload on the amygdala in adults is to shrink it. So people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, whether it's from a car accident, from being shot at, being blown up, being raped as an adult, the amygdala itself is shrunken. It has um, a cut down set of remaining functions and it's got a hair trigger and anything that even begins to remind the amygdala of the galaxy of stimuli that preceded the event which fried the circuits is likely to send the amygdala into a complete flashback mode. And when the amygdala goes into flashback mode, so does the hippocampus, the hippocampi, because there's two of them and you're not allowed to say hippocampus us. The hippocampus, it means seahorse because that's the vague, rough, approximal shape of the neural structure. It wraps around the amygdala, like a pair of seahorses around the walnut, and the hippocampus deals with short-term memory and laying short-term memories to become long-term memories. And when there's some incredibly stressful situation that is busy frying the amygdala with, with too much stress, the hippocampus develops short circuits as well. And you can get little feedback loops of neurons which lock up islands of memory, which means that they're not accessible to the long-term memory. They're still stuck in the hippocampus. And when the amygdala is triggered to hit a flashback, the hippocampus can dump that island of memory onto the consciousness and you get a complete visual audio, audio replay at the same time as you treat it to a complete endocrine response flashback. You know, all the adrenaline, all the cortisone. And speaking of cortisone and stress, um, the cortisols that are released during the stressful encounter are there to help you get through the moment. And it sets up your fight or flight response, the adrenaline and the cortisol. But cortisol suppresses immune function. And there's a really nice piece of work reported in New Scientist where I think the students at Anchorage University in Alaska got diaries for everybody who lived on a particular housing estate. And they had shopping carts full of diaries and the students would walk the housing estate, randomly meeting people who lived there, asking the people to basically fill in the diary from last time they'd had an encounter with the students and list all of the events in their lives you know mum and dad had a big fight his grandpa died dad lost his job mum ran away with a new boyfriend you know all the things that are, that are happening the kid got expelled from school for smoking behind the shelter sheds sister's pregnant whatever and they found there was a fairly precise correlation that three days after the stressful event, that was when the children in the house came down with a runny nose, the parents got the flu, had to take days off work because they were sick. Essentially, the stressful event caused a fight or flight response, which damped the immune system so that they could put all their energy into, into living through the moment. And then their damped down, compromised immune system was hit by whatever bug was going. And to nail it all down, as they filled in the diaries, they must have had portable screens or something, and they got the people to provide a urine sample, which was then analysed for cortisol levels, because as you make the cortisol, it is then ex excreted by the kidney. And that stops build-up from happening. And yeah, there was, there was a precise correlation. Major stressful event, cortisol release, fight or flight response, immune suppression, and then you get sick three days later. It's interesting to just do a rough anecdotal correlation of all the children that one has observed who are constantly snotty and runny at the nose who live in domestic chaos and compare them to the children one knows who live in domestic tranquility who are all rosy-cheeked and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and happy and there is a precise correlation between the domestic environment the parents provide 
and how sickly and miserable the children may be. Not saying all sickness is caused by this, but a lot of it is. Right, so uh, <clears throat> the PTSD, which can come from any traumatic stress, shrinks the amygdala, damages the hippocampus, and leaves the individual in a permanently hair trigger, stressed out, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's going to go wrong next situation. Right, so just before we move off the combat veterans' children who grow up with unstable parental events. Sometimes the combat veteran is silent and morose and won't talk to anybody. Other times they're trying to be happy and they're manic. Other times they're leaning on the alcohol. All kinds of things. Give the interruption. I heard a beep. It means that the other phone has finished charging. And at the same time, I have to refill the pot belly. So, the child of a combat veteran, owing to the statistical likelihood of growing up in a stressful and destabilizing environment, is stuck with this three times the background society's death rate from suicide, and that goes on for the whole of their lives. And as well as that, the combat veteran's children get a 1.8 times the background death rate from accidents. Attention seeking, trying to live up to the image of the combat veteran in the previous generation. They've also got a 1.2 times the background population's death rate annually from illness. Because you've got to be tough, you know, like remember the Alamo, you know, World War I, Passion Girl, you don't know what life's like until you've been through an artillery barrage. What do you want to go to the doctor for? A sucking chest wound is nature's way of telling you to slow down, matey. Get back on that motorbike. It's a caricature, but that's the sort of thing. So combat veterans' children die out four times the rate of normal children. I've been known to suggest in other videos that this could even be seen as a, um, a Darwinian selection factor to make sure that the meek will inherit the earth because the warriors breed badly. Okay, <clears throat> so we move on to the nub of the issue, child sexual assault survivors. 18 times the background society's death rate by suicide, 49 times the background society's death rate from accidental drug overdose. So being a child sexual assault survivor is nine times worse than being a combat veteran. It's six times worse than being a combat veteran's child in terms of death rates. And this is because the child's amygdala and hippocampus are not fully formed when they're subject to the extreme overload of stress of being used by somebody else who prioritizes their gratification, their sexual desires over a child's right to grow up unmolested. And uh, it's terrifying for the child. They don't know what's going on. And once they are old enough to know what's going on, once they've figured it out, then it is crushing to realize that they don't count for anything. Then they, they come out of it feeling that they're not good for anything at all other than to gratify somebody else's prurient desires. They're some adults search for the perfect orgasm or whatever it is, looking for an ever younger partner because younger is supposed to be sexier in our marvellous modern society. Right. <clears throat> so that's, that's apparently the mechanism. Right? It's damage to the amygdala, it's damage to the hippocampus, it's lasting, permanently altered self-esteem. And, okay, let's move on to the number crunchy side of this movie. Now, I've broken these figures down, and uh, I've used 
the latest figures I've heard off the radio, the Australian population is 23.3 million. The annual suicide toll is 2,700. That's 2013 figures compared to 2007 when it was 1,800 and something. So <clears throat> if we divide the 2,700 into the 23.3 million, we find we've got one in 8,629.629. So if you've got a year, that's the suicide rate for the overall population of Australia. That's everyone. If you've got 10,000 people, then you're looking at 10.3 uh, months per 10,000. Now, the town I live in, Glen Innes, has 10,000 people in the Glen Seven Shire, and I would have to say that we get about a suicide every, you know, 10 months or so, maybe, you know, every eight months to a year, but it's something like that. <clears throat> So that is 0.0001158 or 0.0158%. That's annually, right? If you multiply the annual rate by 70 years to take the life of a child from age 10, to age 80, then the lifetime suicide rate or incidence is 0.8106%. But uh, yeah, it's, it's basically eight per thousand, right? Eight per thousand over their lifetime will suicide in Australia at the moment. That's the current what's happening now. Combat veterans, they have twice the background suicide rate. So one in every 4,314.8, which is one every 5.16 months per 10,000, which is 0.0236% annually. And if we multiply that by 55, because I'm assuming the combat veteran is maybe 25 when the traumatic event happens, because some will be 20 and some will be 30 and some will be 18 and some will be 32. So from age 25 to 80 is 55 years. That gives your combat veteran a 1.2738% lifetime chance of committing suicide or lifetime incidence. The combat veteran's children with three times the background suicidal death rate, is one every 2,876.4513. That's in the population. If you've got 10,000 combat veterans' children, then every 3.445 months, one of them kills himself. Their annual chance is... 0.0374%, right? Multiply that by 70, age 10 to age 80, and you get a 2.4318% lifetime chance of dying by suicide, plus their 1.8 times the accidental death rate, 1.2 times the illness death rate, gives them a 1 in 2,157.4072 rate of committing suicide. So the individuals have a 0.04635% annual suicide rate and a 3.244, I'm oh sorry, that's yeah, annual chances of dying. Uh, and their chance of dying from suicide or accidental death or illness is 3.2445%. Now, <clears throat> we move on to the child sexual assault survivors with 18 times the background rate. Instead of 
one every 8,629, it's one every 479. Instead of take 10,000 average normal people and once every 10 months and 10 days, one of them will commit suicide, you take 10,000 child sexual assault survivors and what are we talking at? Uh, once every 0.5574166 days, which is once, uh, months rather, which is once every 16.72 days. So slightly over once a fortnight, one of your 10,000 child sexual assault survivors is going to kill themselves. They have an annual incidence of 0.20844%. Multiply that by 70 for their lifetime incidence of death by suicide and you're getting 14.5908%, almost 15%, 14.6% chance of committing suicide versus 0.8 of a percent lifetime incidence of committing suicide. And uh, I hadn't done that last little crunchy bit where you break it down to the annual incidence and then multiply by the expected lifetime back in 2010 when I very first heard these figures. And I just realized that I got a bit out of sync um, when I was telling you where I got the figures from. I told you about where the combat veterans and the combat veterans children's figures come from. Uh, the figures for child sexual assault survivors, they come from a different place entirely. They come from the ABC radio in 2010 on Valentine's Day. It's a great day for releasing the figures, but that's when it came out in, I think it was five consecutive bulletins, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on Valentine's Day. The ABC radio national news bulletins covered the item that the Australian Medical Association's journal the AMA is like the Union for Doctors in Australia. Their journal was covering research conducted by Melbourne University's School of Medicine. Melbourne University's School of Medicine began in 1965 to study the lifetime outcomes of the survivors of child sexual assault. In 1985, after studying the early ones for 20 years, they stopped adding new subjects to the survey because they had 2,000 of them. In 2005, they drew a line under it and started to actually crunch the numbers and you know do this rigorous statistical analysis that you have to do to get a paper peer researched and published in the AMA journal. Uh, <clears throat> So by 2010, they'd done the number crunching and they'd had the peer-reviewed research published and it was being treated as a news item. 18 times the suicide death rate, 49 times the death by accidental overdose rate. And I got pretty stirred up by it. And back in the days before I was on YouTube, I used to be on typewriter. And I used to write lots of letters to my local state and federal members of parliament, bringing things to their attention and asking that they draw the attention of the relevant minister to these issues. And I have, uh, I have what they call a piling system. So here's what survives out of my piling system of my attempts to address the issue that uh, the survivors of child sexual assault were being put at extremely increased danger of committing suicide by the actions of somebody else who was committing a crime. And I know it's early in the day, but the sun is over the yard arm. So you can guess what I'm about to do. Can you be seeing the vapor? Label out for a malt liquor video. Okay, one mouthful that shouldn't affect my reading ability.
may even improve it because I was getting a little bit dry in the throat. Okay, so as I explained to you, I heard this first on Valentine's Day. So 10 days later, 24th of February 2010, I wrote to my then local member of parliament, the Honourable Rich Torbay MP, independent for, New for Northern Tablelands, Speaker in the House of Parliament. Dear Richard, and uh, I had a few other things to talk about as well. So here's where it starts to get slightly interesting. Um, yeah, we'll start off like this. After I put the granny glasses on. On another subject, please find enclosed a copy of yesterday's letters column printed in the Glen Innes Examiner where you'll find my most recent submission. Happily, there's only a single typographic error which didn't mangle too much of the meaning and none of it was cut before printing. I'd like you to read it twice, please, Richard, because the results of the Victorian survey have legislative ramifications that go in two entirely separate directions. One toward reforming the existing laws on drug use, the other towards regulations concerning charges to be prosecuted with all matters involving child sexual abuse. The finding that people who've been sexually assaulted as children go on to have 18 times the death by suicide rate compared to the unmolested, quote, normal population, unquote, with deaths clustering around 18 years after the abuse, typically when the victim is in their 30s, well, wouldn't that justify an attempted murder charge being laid concurrently with every charge of child sexual assault? Because if the molested are growing up to have 18 times the suicide rate, then they are 95% of the suicides. That was my assumption then. I don't think it's correct. And in my later figures, I adjusted that downwards to be 90% of the suicides. So I, I effectively took my initial wild guess that uh, 18 out of 19 is 95%, but 18 times the rate doesn't guarantee 95% of all suicides are from child sexual assault. So. <clears throat> I've been conservative and I've said that 10% of suicides are for some other reason not connected to child sexual assault. That was what I thought at the time on my first cut analysis of the situation. 95% of the suicides, which means that there aren't so very many other people killing themselves at all, not for any other reasons. And there were 1,881 deaths by suicide in Australia in 2007, or so I heard on the ABC Radio National a couple of weeks ago. So that's 1,787 from the after effects of child sexual assault versus 94 for all other reasons, which I'm sure you'll agree constitutes a considerably vast amount of murder currently going unremarked, let alone punished. The other finding that people who've been sexually assaulted in childhood have 49 times the background, the rate of accidental drug overdose deaths of the unmolested, quote, normal population goes to add Wait to the call for attempted murder charges to be added to all matters of child sexual assault going before the courts. There are something like 500 drug overdose deaths per year in Australia, I think, from memory. It used to be 350 a year from heroin until John Howard's first administration tripled the purity and halved the price by closing the Tasmanian office of the Australian Customs Service. Then heroin, heroin overdose deaths peaked around 1,100 just prior to the GST coming in. That's goods and services tax for those overseas people. <clears throat> By then, most of the badly controlled addicts were dead and the death rate dropped to a low of $350 a year, which was all very nice, but for the simultaneous rise in cocaine, amphetamine and ecstasy use. Now... I'll just break that there for a second. The drug overdose death rates, where we were having maybe 500 people die and 350 of them or 450 of them, I think, were from, uh, from opiates. That's opium, morphine, heroin, coadine, omnipon, pethidine, oxycontin tablets. They're all opiates. The Latin name for opium is Papava Somniferum, because whatever your problem, it'll let you get to sleep. It's not a party drug, it's a pain relief drug. 
an example of how a trigger event in infancy can predispose somebody to become an opiate addict the very first time they are exposed to an opiate would be um, Hermann Goering, right? head of the German Luftwaffe in the Second World War. He was the Reichsmarshal. He was the head of the Prussian secret police. In the First World War, he was a fighter pilot. He got the Pool de Marit, the Blue Max, Germany's highest decoration for bravery. He had been a cavalry officer. He was a headstrong, ambitious, arrogant, bumptious upstart, constantly trying to prove himself, his own self, his own worth in the eyes of others, trying to establish that he was better than everybody else, which is usually a good sign of an overcompensated inferiority complex. If you scale it back to his early beginnings, Hermann Goering's father was the commissioner for German Southwest Africa. Hermann Goering's mother went home to Germany when she was pregnant to have the baby back at home. She breastfed little Hermann for three months, at the end of which she left him with the household servants. And she went back to Southwest Africa for three years. So there you've got traumatic maternal deprivation syndrome. Historically, the first time three-year-old Herman saw his mother, he ran the length of a banquet hall to get to her and she thought, oh, isn't it lovely, my darling's coming to give me a cuddle. Not a bit of it. As soon as he got there, he grabbed a hold of her belt on her waist and he swung off it and he commenced kicking holes in her shins with his hobnailed boots. I don't know what the German is for it, but he was screaming, you left me, you left me, you bitch. Lack of self-esteem, the feeling that he was not good enough, that his parents abandoned him and left him with the household servants, and therefore he was constantly trying to establish his own sense of worth. In 1927, he was shot in the leg during Hitler's beer killer putsch. They took him to hospital where he was given morphine. Bingo. Hermann Goering was a junkie for the rest of his life. In 1945, when the Allies captured him, he was in a car carrying one suitcase, and in the suitcase were 180,000 OxyContin tablets. He was looking after tomorrow. He was taking his supply. Nothing else mattered but his pain relief. I've met several junkies who have told me that the very first time they tried heroin, they sort of collapsed, sliding down the wall, saying, Ah, oh, I've been looking for that all my life. People who are in pain seek pain relief. Okay, let's get back to the letter. But for the simultaneous rise in cocaine, amphetamine and ecstasy use. Because those drugs make people feel like a million dollars on top of the world. They can do anything. They can go anywhere. They're real high-speed operators. So if they can't kill the pain because they can't get the opiates, you move on to the stimulants and you try and power past the depression and the misery and the pain and the low self-esteem. So some opiate addicts were killed by the doubling in purity and tripling in price or tripling in purity and, and halving in price when Johnny Howard ab uh, abolished the Tasmanian branch of the Customs Service. And that's a matter of record. The first thing Johnny Howard did when he came into power was he put the auditors through ATSIC because Pauline Hanson said he had to. The second thing was abolish the Tasmanian Customs Branch. So anybody who wanted to import heroin into Australia, put it on a boat and went to Tasmania and then bundled it up into packages and posted it from the post office. It was such a pronounced effect that when Johnny Howard was trying to be re-elected, he was at a press conference, Maxine McHugh asked him on camera, live, Mr. Prime Minister, is heroin going to be cheaper under the GST because it's already six times cheaper than it was under Paul Keating? Right? All the badly controlled heroin addicts died because of the cheap, strong, pure heroin. Those who didn't die but they couldn't get heroin they changed to the stimulant drugs and you can make stimulants in your bathroom 
Ephedrine plus simple chemistry equals methamphetamine. And you buy ephedrine at the chemist. Like I said, back to the letter. So I'm educatedly guessing that the current rate is 500 a year and 49 times the rate means 98%. That'd be 490 dead from attempting to self-medicate the after effects of having been sexually abused as children and 10 people who sadly miscalculated a quote recreational dose. So, as well as forcing the child sex perpetrators to face the downstream consequences of their actions, then there is no longer any even remotely valid reason or rationale for the continued existence of laws that criminalise the use of, bracket, currently illegal, close bracket, drugs. The time-honoured and cherished fantasy that illegal drugs are pushed onto otherwise perfectly happy and functional youngsters whose lives are then ruined by the substances which addict them and wastes them and finally kills them, is finally put to rest. The way to make somebody into a dead drug addict is to sexually abuse them, roughly 18 years before you'd like to bury them. Of course, for every dead drug addict, there'll be another four who kill themselves deliberately. But the existing systems are apparently designed with the purpose in mind of demonising and persecuting the one in five of the survivors who find themselves unable to live without using the chemical painkillers. But they haven't actually tried to kill themselves, they're just trying to numb the pain sufficiently to be able to stay alive. I don't particularly care how hand in glove you've been with the law and order lobby or the police association or the security industry in the past. It's time to begin living in an evidence-based world, Richard. People who like to think that traditional practice is beyond questioning and altering in the face of contemporary evidence have been on the losing side of every issue that humans have ever debated. So, I require you to do these two things. Fix it such as those facing child sexual assault charges are automatically also charged with attempted murder and repeal the existing laws which prohibit the use of, quote, illegal drugs, unquote, because these drugs pose no threat to, quote, normal, unquote, society. Whereas if they were legal, then perhaps those who feel they need them could do so at least unmolested and perhaps under medical supervision. And then I posted it on the 18th of March the Hon Richard Torbay, these days known as Tricky Dicky Richard Torbay, because uh, he had to stand down and resign after it was demonstrated to ICAC that he was actually in the pay of a Labor politician called Eddie O'Bead, so he was not actually particularly independent. Dear Mr. Wharton, I write in acknowledgement of your correspondence received in my office 16 March 2010, enclosing an update on the Sunfoil project, together with a photocopy of your letter in the Glen Innes Examiner and request that persons charged with child sexual assault also be automatically charged with attempted murder and that the current laws on drugs be reformed. Thank you for providing me with this detailed information. I have indeed read it several times and will consider your views should any of these issues be raised in Parliament. I wise to advise, yes, that's a typo, should be I wish to advise, that as requested, I have made direct representations on your behalf to the Attorney General, the Honourable John Hatzistergos, in regard to the issues of law. Yours sincerely, Richard of the Torbay. I've heard that he's in New Zealand, impersonating a Maori and running a tacky Awe shop. I think Takiyawe is Maori for fast food. That came with a letter from the Justice and Attorney General's Department, received 9th of April to the Hon Rich Torbay. It was dated April Fool's Day. Dear Mr Torbay, the Attorney General has asked me to acknowledge receipt of your correspondence dated 18 3 2010 on behalf of Warbles on a Lot. The matters you have raised have been noted and are presently receiving attention. A response will be provided in due course somebody from the community relations unit. So I wrote back and I didn't keep the next letter, but uh, thank you for keeping me updated. And I've also noted your additional comments about child sexual assault and the church in your letter to the editor of your local newspaper. As undertaken earlier, when I receive a response, I will write to you again. Tricky Dicky Richie Torbay.
10th of May. Dear Mr. Wharton, crossed out for Chris, I write further to your letter posted on 15 March 2010 and to my subsequent representations on your behalf to the Attorney General, the Hon John Hatzistagos, concerning your proposals regarding child sex offenders and drug laws. In a detailed response received from the Attorney General, copy enclosed, I am advised due to the reasons outlined that the State Government does not intend to introduce any new legislation that would see child sex offenders charged with attempted murder, nor the decriminalisation of the use of illicit drugs. I am advised that the State Government has established a number of diversion programs to assist serious drug offenders to reduce their dependency. These programs have been outlined in the Attorney General's reply for your information. Tricky Dicky, the Maori. 28 April, received 10th of May, the Attorney General of New South Wales, the Hon G.R. Torbay. Dear Mr. Torbay, I write in representation, in reply to your representations on behalf of Warbles on a Lot, regarding a proposal to charge all child sex offenders with attempted murder and about the legalisation of illicit drugs. The charges to be laid against an accused person are determined by the prosecuting authority, which in the case of a serious offence such as attempted murder, would be the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP. I can advise that the government has no plans to introduce legislation to require that all child sex offenders be charged with attempted murder. To secure a conviction for the offence of attempted murder, prosecutors are required to prove the accused person had an intent to kill the victim. A charge of attempted murder would only be appropriate where there is evidence of such intent. Under the Crimes Act of 1900, the maximum penalty for attempted murder is imprisonment for 25 years. The maximum penalty for having sexual intercourse with a child under the age of 10 years is also imprisonment for 25 years. However, if that offence is committed in circumstances of aggravation, the maximum penalty is imprisonment for life. Circumstances of aggravation include where the child was under the authority of the offender, where the offender deprives the child of his or her liberty, and where the offender breaks and enters into any building with the intention of committing the offence. Warbles on a lot also suggests reform of the criminal law to decriminalise the use of illicit drugs. I can advise that the government considers the supply, traffic and manufacture of illicit drugs to be serious offences. However, the government recognises that a range of criminal justice options can be appropriate to respond to drug use, such as diversion programs. For example, a New South Wales drug court established February 1999. I think it's since been disbanded by subsequent governments who are cutting costs. The drug court, uh, there's a similar program for young offenders, the Youth Drug and Alcohol Court. Yeah, they canned it too. Magistrates' early referral into treatment program, well, they can refer them all they like, but there's no funding for beds in treatment centres. Uh, I trust the information provided is of assistance to you in responding to Mr. Warbles on a lot. Yours faithfully, John Hatsister Goss. Well, I wasn't real happy with that. So my reply to their 10th of May letter telling them it was all too hard went out on the 18th of May to Richard Torbay. Regards the 10th of May letter covering the Attorney General's 28 4 to 10 letter explaining that more or less everything which I suggested is all way too hard. This is not an unexpected response. The ensconced officials are arguing in favour of the status quo ante. Wow, how unusual. But their principal objection that to obtain a murder conviction, the prosecution needs to prove that the perpetrator had an intent to kill the victim. Whereas I contend that if the government were to make the public aware, bracket via a suitable media campaign, close bracket, of the results of the Victorian child sex assault victim suicide overdose death rates being 18 times and 49 times that of the background population, then it should be quite easy to draft a legislation which reverses the burden of proof against such defendants in such matters. It's apparently quite okay to confiscate the assets on suspicion of, quote, organised crime or drug dealing, unquote, with a reverse burden of proof, according to tonight's radio news, to be enacted by Christmas, apparently. And yeah, they have brought that into law. If the cops arrest somebody and charge them with being a drug dealer, they can confiscate all that person's assets on the assumption that those assets have been acquired by illegal means, and then it's up to the individual to prove to the court that they 
actually acquired the assets lawfully. It's a reverse burden of proof. If you can apply it to drug dealers, why can't you apply it to child sex offenders? Why not? Why can't the convicted pedophiles, pederasts and child molesters be prosecuted for attempted murder with the same reverse burden to prove that they did not know that their search for the absolute orgasm was very likely to damage their victim to the point of death? 18 and 49 times the, quote, normal death rates from suicide and accidental overdose. If one were to take an action that increased another individual's chances of eventually resulting, eventual resulting premature death by 3,400%, then why in the name of, quote, justice, should the perpetrator escape at least a charge of attempted murder? It's murder by selfishness, murder by recklessness, Maybe it's murder by slow motion and neglect, but it is an action taken for selfish purposes without regard to inherent harms and dangers to the life of an other individual. One might as well suggest that a sniper should only be charged with, quote, dangerous discharge of firearms in a public place, unquote, rather than, quote, attempted murder, unquote, on the grounds that the sniper was trying for headshots and some of them missed whereas the sniper was probably really only seeking the thrill of the marksman hitting a chosen target. The, quote, too hard basket, unquote, wins again. Pity about that. Sadly, pretty much everything else which the AG's letter had to say was but a tired and hackneyed repetition of the restatement of the existing position, the one which has not worked for 150 years or so the deliberate demonization of the victims of the past generation's parental failures. And I say that deliberately. I want you to think about all the high wealth, high profile, high net worth individuals, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the shakers and movers who have been so busy with their career, they palmed their children off onto somebody else to do the parent's job and then when the kid goes bad in teenagehood turns into a junkie and then dies in their late 20s or early 30s oh it's all the kids fault you know like mummy and daddy did their very very best you know we worked 60 hours a week each just to try and provide all of the material goodies that the kid didn't want the kid wanted personal attention from the parents and instead they were farmed out to somebody and somewhere along the way something happened to them and for some reason they just couldn't stay away from the drugs it's a status quo ante that the powerful the lawmakers the movers and shakers to say nothing of the people who are running around being paid to persecute drug users don't want to know about they don't want to change anything they're happy with their existing assumptions regardless of the truth or accuracy of those assumptions but enough of a rant let's get back to the letter i'll probably rant later anyway the existing position the one which hasn't worked for 150 years or so the deliberate demonization of the victims of the past generation's parental failures because that stratagem provides ongoing employment for the otherwise unemployable muscle brain buffheads who deeply desire to wear shiny shoes with neat straight, straight creases in their trousers while standing in straight lines, especially if it pays their mortgage. As I pointed out in my letter of 15th of March 2010, the existing laws concerning drug laws might perhaps be almost faintly justifiable if the assumptions they were drafted to address were in fact correct. As it happens, in an evidence-based policy worldview, there is no possibility of the government's chosen policy leading to any situational definition of, quote, success. However, it is their choice. If they choose to be paid to decide to push wet poo up a steep hill with a wide-toned fork and a sewage outlet immediately upstream, who are we to attempt to explain it to them? You can lead the horse to water, but if it doesn't want to drink, there's no point giving it an enema. Like I said, that went out on the 18th of May 2010.
27th of May 2010, Tricky Dicky Ritchie, one of the most corrupt politicians that's ever made it into Parliament in Australia, wrote back, I write in acknowledgement of your correspondence dated 18 May 2010 regarding the responses received from the Attorney General, the Honourable John Hatsister Goss, and the Minister for Police, the Honourable Michael Daly. Your additional comments are noted. I wise to advise that as requested, I have made further representations on your behalf to the Minister for Police, the Honourable Michael Daly. Tricky Dicky Richie Torbay, who used to be the member for Northern Tablelands before he had to resign in disgrace. For a Lebanese Maronite Christian, he is almost passable as a Maori, isn't he? So, end of February to the end of May. Three months. And I didn't achieve anything. I've never heard anything more ever again about that peer-reviewed research by Melbourne University School of Medicine. There's still an entire industry devoted to trying to research why there are so many depressed people committing suicide in our wonderful, wonderful capitalist world. The information is already in the bag. We know what's going on. But anyway, I, I decided to crunch these numbers a little bit further and see what else I could sort of extract from their juices. As I said, 18 out of 19 equals 95%. But to be conservative, allowing that the actual figure may be less than that, let's say that 10% of suicides are from all other causes. Considering that this year's suicides reflect the child sexual assault that was happening 18 years ago. Because, as I said, the deaths cluster 18 years after the abusive event. So if someone's killing himself now, 2014, that reflects what was happening in terms of child sexual abuse 18 years ago, back in 1995. Yes, kind of, roughly, makes sense. There's a time lag while people slowly come to terms with it and struggle with it, and finally the ones who are badly damaged enough kill themselves. And if they're particularly resilient and persistent, you know, they might last 30 years, 40 years. What happened to Robin Williams when he was a kid? Hmm? Why was a really smart person like that? Hopelessly depressed, fighting with alcohol and drugs. What went on in his life? Hmm? Considering that this year's suicides reflect child sexual assaults 18 years ago, 90% of 2,700 is 2,340. 2,340 divided by 14.5908, which I admit it's the child sexual assault survivor's lifetime incidence of committing suicide. And I... I recognise that I'm massaging the figures here because there is a there is a, a cluster, a peak around 18 years, and I'm using a lifetime figure, but it's the only way I can dream up to get anything at all that may be even halfway useful out of the numbers. 2,340, which is the child sexual assault survivors out of the total suicide pool, divided by 14.5908 equals 160.375, which is 1%, which means you multiply that by 100, and you get 16,037.5 child sexual assaults in Australia in 1995. I think that's a ballpark figure, but I don't think it's horribly wrong. I have no qualifications as a statistician, but... My bullshit content varies between 9.3% when somebody else is teaching me to do something and 1.3% when I'm trying to teach myself to do something. When they were trying to teach me how to be a nurse, which I eventually completed, as the documents attest,
awarded the grade of distinction with 90.7%. So that means I got 9.3% of stuff wrong. Whereas when I was trying to teach myself to do something like design and laminate and carve an aeroplane propeller, I thought this thing should make 140 pounds of thrust. It made 138. So it was 98.7% accurate, which means a 1.3% bullshit factor. So somewhere between 1.3 and 9.3%. That gives me an average bullshit content of 5.3%, depending on you know where I fit on that curve, whether I'm teaching myself or being taught. So let's just say that everything I've said today is going to be 94.7% accurate because that is my average accuracy. Yes, when pontificating and musing and spouting forth ideas. I can say with 94.7% accuracy, as a fool on the hill, that there were 16,037 child sex assaults in all of Australia in the year 1995. So <clears throat> overall, child sexual assault survivors, 14.59% die by suicide. 2.1% die by accidental drug overdose. 9% grow up to become perpetrators of child sexual assault, while 85% of child sexual assault perpetrators were themselves abused as children. So <clears throat> it's a pretty grim situation. The only really bright features that I can think of is that only 9% of the abused children grow up to become abusers when they reach adulthood. And the other one is that the recidivist rate for child sexual assault perpetrators who have been charged, convicted, sentenced, and then released back into the community, the recidivist rate is only 20%. Four out of five of them learn their lesson when they get caught. But it seems to me that a public relations campaign or a, a publicity campaign drawing everybody's attention to the fact that child sexual assault raises one's death by suicide rate from one in 8,629 to one in 457, that instead of having eight tenths of 1% chance of dying by suicide during your life, child sexual assault survivors have you know, nearly 15%, it's 14.59%. I think it might change society's attitude the people who suspect that a kid may be being abused will be a whole lot less likely to sit on their hands and keep their mouth shut because they think it's none of their business. I think we have a first aid duty of care to the children to do whatever we can to educate people so that this phenomenon starts to turn around and die out instead of growing every year. And another action that we could take as a society to reduce the incidence of child sexual assault in my eyes would be to ban the use of ladies razors on the grounds that adult humans who have been through puberty grow hairs on their legs they grow hairs on their armpits and they grow hairs on their underpants the only normal humans who have no hair in their underpants are too young to have reached puberty if anybody says to you that the reason they shave their legs or their armpits or their underpants is because they want to be more sexually attractive for their partners, I want you to understand that what they are admitting to, ipso facto per se, is that they believe that real men actually are attracted by six-year-olds with tits. If you want a better argument or a better discussion of that phenomenon, go to my playlists, look for Warbles in the Wilderness series, and there's a video there called The Pedophile's Blade. There are 
two versions of it, a long version and a short version. Short one's just the poem, the long one is the poem with the explanation. But this video is pretty much long enough, I think. There you go, Gummy Roy. As you said, imagine what sort of a video Warbles on a lot could make if you tried to unpack the child sexual assault, suicide, death rate statistics. This is probably the 15th time I've tried to make this movie. I've shot five several, uh, five separate full-length versions and then decided that there was an inaccuracy here or there was something wrong there which was a showstopper. From memory, and I haven't reviewed this yet, but from memory, I think this one's going to get uploaded. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. There's a lot to think about. And if you are yourself a survivor of child sexual assault, then try to take some comfort in the fact that three quarters of the child sexual assault survivors do not commit suicide. They do not die as junkies. They do not become perpetrators. They struggle through. And if you're planning on donating to some foundation to do research to figure out what they can do to determine the cause of depression, maybe you can redirect your funds to something that has not already been fully researched and understood. Because this has been nailed down. That, uh, that Victorian survey, it's... It's as ironclad as the Swedish survey, which discovered by a similar method at, at exactly the same time. 1965, the Swedes started giving their kindergarten children one hour of formal lectures in school on human reproduction. By the time they emerged from the pipeline at the end of high school, they'd had 500 hours of formal education on human reproduction. Not just the plumbing and what goes where and sperms and eggs, but also maternal and infant health, gynecology, obstetrics, urology, sexually transmitted diseases, financial planning, counselling therapy, relationship theory, all the galaxy of subjects that surround human reproduction. And so in 1997, New scientists covered the end results of their survey, you know, in 20, uh, 1995, they drew a line under it, crunched the numbers, published their data. In cooperation with Edinburgh University, where they studied a cohort of children who had half an hour, or maybe it was one hour of sex education, not lectures on human reproduction, one hour of sex education, just before leaving high school. And the Scottish kids who were kept in ignorance were compared by way of lifetime outcomes with the Swedish kids who were educated. And from memory off the top of my head, those who had the 500 hours had a lower rate of being physically or sexually abused as children because they understood what was going on and they wouldn't stand for it. They would run away, they would disclose. Whereas the ignorant kids, they thought that's what grown ups were allowed to do for kids, two kids. So a lower rate of being physically and sexually abused as children, a higher age at first sexual encounter. When you know what you're doing, you don't throw away your virginity. A lower number of partners before settling into a permanent relationship. A higher age at first pregnancy. A lower rate of unwanted pregnancy. A lower rate of terminations of pregnancies. A lower rate of unemployment a lower rate of relationship breakdown, a lower rate of being diagnosed with a mental illness or treated by a psychiatric institution, a lower rate of being arrested by the police or convicted by the courts or serving time in a criminal penitentiary. They also had a lower rate of bankruptcy, a lower rate of cancer. The survey and the results stated that by every measurable criterion, the way to make sure your children have a miserable life is to keep them ignorant about, uh, about human reproduction for as long as possible so that with no idea what they're doing, they can figure it out for themselves on the basis of what feels good. So, 
all I can think of to do about it is tell the truth whenever somebody asks me a question on the topic. Dummy Royd asked the question, Dummy Royd got the movie going. If anybody doesn't like it, well, I'm sorry. Once upon a time, I was convicted of telling a lie. I was 18. It was humiliating. I decided if that's what society does to liars, then fuck them, I'll tell them the truth. And if they don't like the answers, they shouldn't have asked the questions. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Cuddle your babies, but don't fuck them. Ciao. Gee, I hope this is worth uploading.